So they are all welcome to the session optimization and insurance, which is under the auspice of Slovenian uh, Insurance Association. Uh, so uh, today we have five lectures, which will start, the first one will start in a minute. So you're very welcome uh, for joining us. And uh, I would just now ask Grega Jerkic to begin with his lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Asta. Hello, everyone. So as Jasna said, my name is Grega Jerkic. I come from a company called Insight. I'm a managing director also of our company. And uh, today I will focus as I'm the first uh, presenting, I will focus a little bit more on the basics. Uh, so something that we see a lot in all of our projects also uh, in insurance. So that a lot of, let's say, high skilled uh, people are spending a lot of time on gathering data checking data and not so much on, let's say, building any kind of advanced models or analysis. And uh, my talk will be mostly about this part of data modeling, data warehousing, and I will do some introduction to dimensional modeling, how the data can be stored, and it's usually stored in some cases, and what are potential benefits. So, and uh, then other colleagues I saw have more advanced topics that are, of course, then uh, interesting on top of uh, the gathered data. Uh, so, as I said, I also have a uh, mathematics background. So, I also studied in uh, Ljubljana. Uh, I've been now focusing in this analytics area for almost 20 years. I wrote some books for Microsoft on this topic, uh, and I work now with, let's say, some of the largest cloud uh, specific data platforms like Snowflake, and we got some prizes also from uh, their company. So we are now around at 55 people. We are focusing on analytics. We employ a lot of mathematicians, physics. Uh, so this is our focus. And we focus a lot in the finance sector, so especially banking and insurance. Okay, so data warehouse, uh, a little bit on this topic. So uh, the whole idea, uh, what I want to present today is this concept where the world is heading a little bit and then how we can, let's say, model the data so that, let's say, actuarial risk departments that are usually want to be completely self-sufficient or are even doing some things, uh, let's say, uh, not uh, directly with the source data, how can they maybe benefit from some of those concepts uh, in the future? So the standard problem or how we would call it is that we have, of course, different data sources, different core systems in insurance. Then we have also more and more, let's say, semi-structured data from some telemetry uh, because it would be interesting to, let's say, calculate uh, specific uh, risks and premium based on, let's say, usage of data. And then, of course, we have new channels, uh, new possibilities that are coming from the internet, uh, image recognitions, and all those things that uh, my colleagues will also discuss. So we have different data sources. Then the idea or what, let's say, is the promise of, let's say, modern data platforms is that you should have everything in one place. So you don't need a lot of different databases, different ideas. So with the cloud and all those capabilities of elasticity, storing, simplification that is coming, the whole idea is to have one data platform. So usually we call this data warehouse, but now it's, let's say, more of a data platform. You will see also data lakes. So different marketing segments, depending on the, let's say, who wants to win something. But at the end, the idea is just to have everything in one place. And then, of course, to have different usage, either standard predefined reporting on top, and then mostly, let's say, concerning actuarial risk departments to have the possibility to build some inputs for their calculation engines or build by themselves using R, Python, whatever is needed, or some specific uh, software uh, capable of calculating specific things regarding uh, the insurance business. And also then probably write back those results because some of those things are, of course, interesting to other departments. So that's the whole, uh, let's say, flow of the data. And it didn't change a lot in all those years, except that the promise is now to put everything in uh, one place. Uh, so uh, we will today focus mostly about on the modeling part. So how, what are some possibilities, how you can model the data. But usually, let's say this flow of the data, just to understand a little bit, so we have different zones of data. So we want to get 
the raw data as it is, because maybe we need some specific data as it is without any models applied on top. And this is usually called something raw. Then we have different conformed area where we want to merge something, do some technical data quality checks so that we can already get notified that something is wrong and then build this modeled part. So this is like a quite standard usual flow of data that makes, let's say, some flexibility later and let's say faster implementation. Uh, so this raw data phase, so the idea is that we store the data as it is. So it can be, I don't know, some relational core system from the insurance that has hundreds of tables, or it can be, I don't know, some feed from a specific application or something that we get uh, from some external sources, from external systems uh, outside our organization because it's needed for some additional calculations and et cetera. So usually we divide the data as you will see into different, let's say areas. So we have structured data, it means it has some schema in the background. So it's more of a relational, so it's stored in a database. Then we have semi-structured data. So all the applications, modern applications now exchange data between this, let's say JSON format. So this is so-called semi-structured uh, uh structure and then we have also let's say called so called unstructured data so different images and uh, voice and etc so which is also interesting in uh, uh further uh, analysis also in insurance business uh so and the idea here is of course that we imply some incremental loading so that we don't of course we don't even have capabilities to load all the data uh each day so that's the whole idea of this raw phase so as it is on the source no aggregation, nothing, because all the new data platforms, you can have terabytes of terabytes of data very, very affordably. So th this is no longer needed as it was, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, or when we were mostly on premise um, in terms of infrastructure. Then this next phase conformed, it's important. This is more of a technical phase. So we try to implement some standard technical data quality checks so that we can already get some information if something goes wrong. So this is a good approach that we try to really build all these data quality checks as soon as possible and build some notifications around it. So that the, the face of let's say advanced business users like aquarials is not on checking, do we now have the full data, what is wrong and on each month end when they need to do the calculations that they first spend a couple of days just checking if everything is uh, relevant. So this uh, work hand in hand with IT is here quite crucial so that these rules can be applied uh, quite quickly in this data pipeline. Uh, but usually this, let's say, conformed area so that you can say, see how it looks like. This is just like a copy or replication of the source data. So this is something that usually a lot of actuarial departments, as we see also in other countries, uh, also we are now working a lot in Germany, they're a separate stream usually because they want to have complete control. They don't want to work directly. Let's say, I don't know, IT is not agile enough or something. And then they want to have this direct access to the source tables. They want to build everything by themselves. So this is, let's say, this conformed area would be like a replication of the source systems. But today we'll focus a little bit on this modeling part so that you can get some ideas, what are some possibilities, and maybe uh, uh, see what would that make sense uh, uh, to do. Okay, maybe some history regarding data warehouse modeling. So it started quite uh, a lot of years back. Uh, so there were like two main uh, branches. You have something called Kimball modeling, dimensional modeling that we will look today. And then you have uh, Bill Eamon that uh, set more of a normalized model in terms of having stored one information only in one place and looking at the whole as an enterprise. So uh, the let's say they were not so very good friends, I must say. I met both of them some 15 years ago. And although the concepts are really similar and they could decide what makes sense and not, they still strictly uh, play their role. But in practice, uh, all these concepts get then merged and you have some sort of a hybrid at the end. But the idea is that Kimball wanted to go more to the business side so that it's a little bit more simplified. And Imo said that simplification for some very large organizations is problematic and we should have some more of a normalized 
uh, area and then built on top of that maybe more simplified uh, uh, data models. So there are different paradigms I wrote here so that you have this later, maybe uh, if you would be interested. So uh, what were their uh, principles and uh, ideas? So as I said, Eamon went more into the standard relational theory uh, regarding the data modeling, third normal form and Kimball did not take so much, let's say, of mathematical approach, but took a little bit more pragmatical one. And if you look at Coral Dwight, the pragmatical is used mostly than, uh, let's say, Eamon's way. So, uh, but at the end, as I said, in practice, usually there is some sort of a hybrid uh, in this case. So uh, what do we usually use on our uh, project? So it a little bit, again, depends because the size of the problem, the size of the organization, the number of source systems also plays a huge role because if you have one unified core system, then it's very simpler to do a data warehouse than to have, I don't know, 15 different systems for each type of, let's say, insurance line, how you want to do a specific part. And then it means it's a bigger complexity. So we have a dimensional model that we look to the, that we will look at it today. So it's a bit more simplified model. Then we have something that is getting quite a huge traction in Europe. Uh, it's called Data Vault. It's more of a let's call it general generalization approach. So that it doesn't matter if it's insurance, if it's uh, retail, whatever it is, it has some standard concepts, and uh, you can uh, do some things much faster. Of course, uh, still you have to do all the nitty gritty things about data quality and integration, but still it provides, let's say, a more of a um, generic approach to building a data warehouse. So it's getting quite a good momentum. And usually then super subtype is something, let's say that IBM pushes a lot or Oracle in their industry models, so like predefined models. So you have a super type, like we would call it, let's say party, and then subtype can be a physical person, a, a company, and they're then divided into two branches, but they have the, uh, the, the, the same super type uh, in the background. So this is something that it's used a lot in, let's say, industry models uh, for some larger organizations. And the data vault in super subtype, we call it a two level data warehouse, because it usually means that you will have this on the atomic layer, more of an IT driven part. And then on top for uh, advanced business users, you will have more of a dimensional because usually this one is a little bit harder to understand or it has to do a lot of complex joints to do something out of it. And then you rather have, let's say, more of a dimensional uh, approach on top. So there are, as I said, different possibilities. So, uh, but ju just to understand, let's say different skill sets that are usually then implied. So what people, let's say, need to learn and how usually the work is divided. So we have the data warehouse modeling where, let's say, the actuarial department that is plays a huge role because this is very business focused part so uh, what is required how it is required what do we need how the history should be tracked what do we need in terms of let's say repetitive tests that needs to be uh, some calculations that need to be rerun i don't know and they should produce the same results if i run it for half year back and the, some uh, such approach so this data warehouse modeling here is a lot of things regarding, let's say, business know-how, and then, of course, these modeling principles that we will discuss. And then we have the data integration, which is more of an IT role. So it means how to successfully build different data pipelines so that you make them robust enough so that you can load this data, uh, have some additional data quality checks, and have this very flexible. So that it's not like, I don't know, now we need to wait a day that something gets refreshed and et cetera. So this is moving. Uh, quite fast, let's say, did this area uh, with the cloud and everything. So here, uh, a lot of new uh, ideas are coming out and uh, it's getting quite interesting. Okay, so uh, now a little bit more to the dimensional modeling so that uh, I can uh, show you some concepts regarding this. Uh, so uh, the foundation of the dimensional modeling is quite, I would say, simply, simple idea that we say, okay, how do we want to analyze the data and what do we want? So I want to, I don't know, analyze invoice premium by, and this first is like measures, all the measures that I want to analyze. And this is something called effect in this terminology. 
and all this data should be stored in tables called fact tables. And then this context, how do I want to analyze something? I don't know, by insurer, by policy, by specific date, by agent, and etc. This is then uh, uh, called a dimension. So very easy to understand. And also uh, for, let's say, uh, basic business users, uh, also easy to grasp. For actuarials and mathematicians, of course, super simple. But uh, the idea here was like to simplify how the data model looks like. So that, for example, if you looked at that model uh, that uh, we had here, so this model is hard to understand. So, and the idea is to simplify from this model to a more business-like model so that, that you have entities that you are familiar with and you don't care in, if in the background, I don't know, the policy, is uh, combined out of 20 tables. You have here everything in one table. So that, that's the whole idea to simplify a little bit the presentation part and not to focus on how this, all this data is uh, structured in the background. Uh, so we have these uh, facts and dimensions together. So as I said, the idea is of course simplicity. And on the other hand, uh, why let's say Kimball was so popular is because of the performance. Because uh, in database, uh, or at least it was, in uh, database world, this joining two tables, uh, it's a specific problem. It's not a linear problem always because the data is not always sorted and et cetera. So <clears throat> it means that uh, the more joins we have, the slower it will work. And the whole idea was to also get some performance boost. Uh, out of uh, such kind of modeling. And uh, additional, let's say, term or uh, naming that when we join specific fact with specific dimensions, it's called a data mart. So in different books, you will see a lot about this. Do you have a finance data mart? Do you have a sales data mart? Do we have a risk data mart and et cetera? So different areas uh, where we want to, let's say, uh, discuss this, how this should be modeled and how this should be uh, done. Uh, and the idea is that dimensions are then shared between different fact tables. Uh, so, and they're called confirmed dimensions. So that, that's the whole idea. And th this is how we can link different areas. So for example, I have everything regarding, let's say the invoice premium, and then I have claims. And of course they have the comfort dimension of policy and I can join this easily uh, and uh, quite intuitive between dimensions, different fact tables, even if they have, let's say, for example, different uh, granularity. So that's the whole uh, idea in the background. Uh, usually how this architecture looks like in practice is that uh, we have some, let's say, very detailed data marts that are basics. So that we have, let's say, the lowest possible granularity that we can get from the core system. So I don't know if everything is on the coverage component, we will not aggregate it to the policy. So we will have it on the coverage component and we have really detailed, let's say, data marts for each business area that is uh, relevant to us. And then in the second phase, we build specific tables, aggregates, whatever is needed based on this model. So that we don't do multiple lines. So we take something from that table and build something and take something and build here, but we have one joint detailed data mart area. And then based on that, we build different uh, models, uh, database models that are needed for any kind of usage. Because uh, what happens a lot uh, when we are discussing is that, let's say for some modeling needs later, for some advanced modeling, you would like to have everything on, let's say one line. So everything on the policy, because uh, that is how the algorithm will look like. So I want to bring everything on the policy. And even if I have something that will break my granularity, I will either take, I don't know, the first record, I will group something, whatever is needed. But I just want to have, let's say, for example, called, let's call it one big table. And uh, I would want to have 200 attributes and that's it. But the idea is that we don't build each time all these requirements directly from the source system, but we go through this line of, let's say some granular data marts and that we have all the same logic how we want to get that data from. So that's the whole idea. Or maybe aggregate some data on top or join something because of performance reasons, but just to have this two level approach 
so that uh, you don't build, let's say, similar things twice, which is usually the approach because uh, each business, let's say, group is divided into multiple uh, areas. And then when you are responsible for, I don't know, labs analysis, you build your own big table and someone that is responsible for, I don't know, some uh, specific mathematical reservations, calculations, or whatever is needed, he builds his own big table. But they are, and both go from the source system and they can do, let's say, different uh, business logic or different truth. And this is the idea that we should first have this granular model and they both fit from the same model so that uh, we, let's say, simplify some things and make support then also uh, easier and uh, the whole maintenance uh, in this case. Uh, okay, so, uh, for a little bit uh, regarding the fact tables. So what is the idea and how we should look at it? As we said, so the fact table is the primary table that holds, let's say some data that is measurable. Uh, of course, it's the largest table usually because you know it, it holds, I don't know, invoice premium or then we, the, let's say, uh, apply some calculations so that we, because we have a lot of clients also doing, let's say, uh, earned and unearned premium calculation uh, inside the data warehouse. So it means it will be multiplied, I don't know, by 12 maybe, uh, or even more depending on the algorithms. And these are usually then the biggest uh, tables uh, when it comes to uh, uh, a data warehouse. Uh, we usually divide the fact tables depending on how additive they are over time. So we call them, uh, let's say, fully additive or transactional. So I, it means like invoice premium. I consume it over months and I get uh, some, some amount of the premium. Then you have semi-additive, which are usually then it means they are like a snapshot of data. So it means, I don't know, mathematical reservation calculated for January and for February, they're not additive, but they're, let's say, uh, uh, they're like snapshots for each month. So, and there are also non-additive, which are, usually maybe not so useful. So it means that uh, it's something that is uh, completely non-additive uh, over all other dimensions. So uh, this is something that maybe is not so used uh, in real life. And we always look at the fact table, what should be our grain? So what should be our lowest level? So some granularity of the data. And usually it's good that we uh, group all the granularities together. So that, as I said, if we have, let's say a coverage component, we have that granularity. And then of course policy can be there, but it will be also implicitly defined by the coverage component because each coverage component can have only let's say one policy. Uh, okay, so how the structure of the table usually looks like. So it has connections to all the dimension tables. So it means it has some foreign keys to all the dimensions like we saw uh, uh, on the picture previously. So connection to, I don't know, policy, agent, specific date and etc. And then we have a uh, part of so-called uh, degenerate dimensions. So you want to store something uh, because of, uh, let's say some debugging or some information that maybe would be needed when you go into detail analysis, like some, I don't know, for example, usually it's some invoice number, settlement number, something that, or a transactional uh, ID from the core system, because you would like to do some backtracking if something went wrong in the data warehouse and you want to see if something, uh, what uh, is the origination of that uh, data and et cetera. So, uh, and then all other um, fields are usually measured. So some numeric fields, depending on the, uh, on the, on the needs. Uh, usually all the, let's say uh, IDs are uh, integer based again because of the storage and performance wise. So, but also this may be in five years with all the advancements in database technology and self-optimization, maybe also this will no longer be uh, needed. Uh, so uh, we usually divide the fact tables into three areas. So we have the transactional, as we said, so then we have periodic snapshot table. So each month, for example, this is the most standard uh, fact table. And then we have accumulating snapshots. So like a year to date snapshots, day-to-day uh, -day with multiple uh, date uh, uh, attributes. So this is usually used, let's say, for some claim handling process or something like that. This is usually interesting. So when it was agreed, when it was like that, when it was like that, when it was like that, and etc. So that you can track it over time, uh, how a specific uh, claim uh, was handled. 
so transaction fact tables, as we said, so these are, let's say, event-based. So each time some event occurs, we store this in the fact table, typical in insurance premium, uh, for example, or uh, even then uh, uh, claim also. So these are some standard things. So when you want something that is additive over time, it's something that is a transactional fact table. Uh, periodic snapshot fact table. So it means we do a snapshot uh, each month and calculate something or even daily, of course. So we can have daily snapshot tables. And this is some value based on that, like a balance on specific uh, uh, time. Uh, so very useful and mostly used in also insurance business. So also then usually also the actuarial departments have to fix this and have monthly snapshots of all the needed data, how it was reported, why it was reported, and to have some additional air hive tables on this and etc. So these are some of the, let's say, very useful uh, and standard tables. These accumulating snapshot fact tables, they are usually not so uh, used a lot, but let's say an example was this, that this claim handling process is something that we usually have uh, that is, let's say, uh, interesting. And also the standard, let's say, snapshot table is also for all the statistics. So how many claims were opened at specific in specific month, how many were closed, how many were moved from one phase to another, and et cetera. So this is also usually because it can, of course, went up and down through the month, and then you want to do a snapshot, what is uh, the current status, and you can then observe some trends over time so that you have multiple uh, snapshots. Uh, okay, so these are fact tables. So it means we divide, we ask ourselves these questions and then divide them and start modeling. But then of course we have dimension tables. So we said, this is something that we, that hold the basic information, how we want to analyze something. Uh, so the whole idea uh, is that, uh, let's say uh, these dimension tables hold uh, all the information that we would like to analyze. So these attributes can be derived, can be calculated. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that they have to be explicitly just from the source system. You can also calculate some things, bring some things back from the, let's say, uh, some advanced calculation. So you do some segmentation, some risk uh, calculation, some risk factors that you apply, and then you group them, you classify them, and you would want to bring this information back to the dimensional table so that other users could analyze it. So this is also an attribute then of a specific dimension for this uh, case. Uh, and of course, as we said, so dimension tables are linking our fact tables and are, let's say, an input to the fact table. Um, so it includes a lot of attributes. And in, let's say, in Kimball style of modeling, the idea is that we somehow, let's call this denormalize, uh, denormalize this uh, uh, table. So it means we if there are some classifications that have additional table, we try to build, bring these classifications directly. So we multiply the same values. If we're looking over multiple, let's say, uh, rows, uh, we can see the same values, not just the keys, but also the names. So we can have, I don't know, ID, name, description, everything in the same table. And usually these tables, if the fact tables are long, these are, let's say, have a lot of uh, columns, so they are, uh, much wider than uh, fact tables in this case. Uh, we will look at some of the problems also, so because the attributes change and we have this, let's say, slowly changing uh, logic that uh, Kimball, uh, let's say, uh, uh, likes to discuss in his modeling principles. So how a uh, dimension table usually consists. So we have, of course, some primary key, something that is unique. And we usually, in data warehouse world, we build our own surrogate keys. So we apply some next ID, we don't care. So, and then of course we have the business key or the source key, because when the new data comes, of course we would like to see if this is really the new data or if it's the old data. So, but why do we imply these surrogate keys? Is because we can, let's say the core system can change, uh, something gets, uh, we would like to merge some things together and we want to track uh, history as we will show later. So that's the idea of building your own uh, surrogate keys in the dimensional modeling principles. So some other, uh, let's say in data world, the idea is that we take the business key and we just hash it. 
so that you have always this reversibility automatically applied without knowing the business key. So, uh, but here in the dimensional modeling, the idea is that we have our own uh, surrogate key. So, and this is something that the database can take care of for you. So it's uh, no problem. And then, as we said, we have multiple different attributes, whatever is needed. So that, that's the whole idea. And usually sometimes it's the problem of distinction, what is now a dimensional attribute and what should be a fact. But if something that does not change, like, I don't know, what is the, what was the, some initial amount? And if it doesn't change, you can put it also in the dimension table. You don't need to put it then to the each uh, record in the fact table in this case. So uh, these uh, distinctions then come to play. Of course, how some data changes also uh, over time. And if it's completely used for the analysis. And usually, as I said, they can have much more complex attributes. So uh, I don't know, calculate when the first coverage was uh, initiated also and put this information on the policy because we need it because of this, this, and this, et cetera. So, and then it can be calculated and added here so that all the users that will be using this will have a much more simplified uh, approach. Uh, also hierarchies are here implemented. And in most cases, uh, even if they are, let's say, in different tables on the source system. Usually here, we let's say call it some sort of denormalization. So we put it into multiple columns because then also different tools, uh, especially for analytics. So this, let's say, low code uh, BI tools where you can drag and drop and analyze something by yourself quickly without writing SQL, uh, they, were, they were very well with such approach. So, uh, and that, that's the whole idea. So, uh, of course, it's not a nice uh, way to do something for the transactional application where you want to have some normalization, uh, but here in the dimensional modeling, we try to do it a little bit differently. So all the hierarchies, all such possibilities are then done directly in the dimension. Of course, if we have, let's say, multiple hierarchies, I don't know, seven level hierarchies, and we have tens of them, we will probably not put these 70 plus fields in the main dimension, but we will do additional hierarchy dimension where we will store the needed hierarchies and do it a little bit different. But as long as these are small hierarchies, and uh, we usually put everything in the one dimension table. Uh, then we have these ge the generate dimensions. So some things that would really, if we would build as a dimension, would have only one attribute, like, I don't know, for example, invoice number, and we would not have any additional needed data for that, uh, or some ID or some settlement number that was generated by the system and it doesn't hold any specific additional information. So usually we can put also some of those things either directly on the fact table or in the generate dimensions, we build them based on the logic of different uh, values. So we build them like all the distinct values and we build some additional dimension values. So this is also in some cases uh, useful and uh, a possible way how to do it. Uh, then I will tackle a little bit uh, what are usually the problems. And this is something that usually then it means that actuarial departments don't like to use the existing data warehouse because the existing, let's say, data warehouse doesn't track very well history changes. And if, let's say, for example, history uh, actuarial department doesn't have what was the value of specific attribute at specific point of time, they cannot recalculate those calculations. And then rather they have their own data pools where they store all the monthly information and have, let's say, this flexibility. So it's quite important if someone wants to support, let's say, the whole organization that also they implement this uh, logic of uh, tracking changes in the data. So Kimball defined, let's say, different possibilities how we can implement this. So type zero, don't do anything. That one is simple one. Uh, type one is also overwriter row, so not a lot of smart things. And then uh, type two is something uh, that they added is something called like, this is the logic of slowly changing dimensions. So the idea is when we have, let's say type one, it means the blue line is how it was, and then we just overwrite it. And we forget about that we had the blue information. So if Grega lived in, let's say, Ljubljana, and then Grega moved to Maribor, Grega is in Maribor. Like he was there for 10 years. So when you do some long-term analysis, you see Maribor. You don't see any more Ljubljana. And then the type two, 
it says they should it should build a knee in time. So when Grega moves, we should know exactly that it moved. Maybe we have some date or we put a technical date the first time we get that information from the system. And then it means that when I do the analysis, I will see correctly that, I don't know, for nine years or nine years and 11 months of premium, it's booked to uh, Ljubljana and the last month is booked to Maribor because I moved. So uh, this is the idea of how to track uh, uh, this. And the idea how Kimball proposed this logic to be done is that when we have the basic table, the dimension table, when we have a key and the business code, we change the logic so that we add new fields. So what it happens is that we say start date and end date. So we get the same business key, but we calculate what is the, let's say, attributes. And we realize that there is a new attribute now coming. So Greg moved to a different state. And it means, OK, we should get a new row. We get here this surrogate key that we have that we said that it's artificial, so we can have a new key. And we close the previous record and add a new record validity. So this is something quite, uh, I would say, standard how we can track history. Some also add flag so that what is current and just have, let's say, effective date. So when the point in time was changed, so they don't do the update. And based on, let's say, standard uh, window functions in SQL, so you can just get this kind of format. So you can get the leg lead uh, row and you can calculate this in the simple select statement. So these are, let's say, some ideas how then the dimensions become aware of this, uh, uh, let's say, changes and it's uh, good to implement. Also, some people want to simplify and they say, okay, our users don't, let's say, actuarials understand and risk department understands, but let's say sales departments don't understand this, they just want to see the, the last values and they don't want to put any filters and we get confused and et cetera. And there are a lot of designs when you have a standard dimensional table and then you have a history table and you build history tables whenever there is a change in the main table. So this is also one of the designs we see uh, in the Kimball, uh, Kimball style. So it depends then on, let's say, usage and ideas, how this will be then used uh, later in the process. So uh, what are some standard issues is that, of course, it brings some complexity of also and then, but it brings the value because you can restore, let's say, the history, how it looked like. But in real life, it's much more complicated. So it's not so, such a simplified approach because uh, we usually have also business validity. So you open something like I will have a new coverage, but it will not start today. It started five days ago. So I have the business validity date. So I get the information today that something is valid from the beginning of the month. So I have B temporal uh, data, uh, uh, date problem. And there are again, possibilities how we can handle this. So uh, it gets more complicated. And then also we have that someone opens something for the future. So that's also then additional potential issue. So something, this coverage will be effective from the next month, for example, or something like that. So it gets always complicated. So, uh, but it's important to imply or implement all those uh, uh, possibilities because uh, at least from my experience, the actuarial department needs this to be confident that they can recreate some calculations and not to store all the archive data and be, let's say, part of the data warehouse uh, journey. Uh, for the end, maybe just how to start, what are usually some practices? So what are, let's say, some design steps? Uh, so of course, you choose the process. You start simply. You don't start Big Bang. You think about the first process. Usually, it means some, let's say, invoice premium or something like that, that it's quite standard where to start. Uh, you think about all the possible sources of that data. Usually it's divided by, I don't know, at least life and property source systems. And then this can be, uh, there are multiple businesses, as, as I said, maybe some are even divided by products. So you can have 10 source systems or maybe you are lucky and just have one source system, let's say for property. Uh, then you define the grain. A good practice is to go as low as low as possible. So you don't need any more of aggregations and et cetera in this uh, in these times because the database are super performant. So uh, you can have billions of billions of rows being analyzed in seconds. So really this uh, logic of having any kind of aggregated data is uh, really uh, uh, 
an old approach and uh, I would not uh, be in favor of it. And then of course, look at the dimensions of how you want to analyze this. This is usually a very quick exercise because uh, a lot of you have a lot of knowledge about insurance and you can quickly see what would be a possible dimensions and then build the fact based on the measures, uh, based on the process. Uh, so regarding the business process, again, you take the process that you understand very well, uh, you invite also other business users to see what would be some interconnections between each business area. Uh, and this is usually how we do it. So we try to tackle who is the owner of specific process, but then also include all those uh, main key stakeholders that will be using that data. So for each department, because the idea of all these data platforms is also to unify your processes, not just to dump somewhere the data, and then the smart people should analyze it, but also to unify a little bit uh, and imply some data governance. So what is invoice premium? How it is calculated? Why is this? Why is this? How is this mathemat mathematical reservation? What is needed here? How it is done? So that you have some common definitions across the whole uh, company. This is also, I would say, very, very important. And we see this as a critical concept uh, when we are modernizing, let's say, the existing data warehouses. Grain, as I said, go very low. Uh, there is no a lot of, to, to discuss. And then a good approach is also to build, uh, maybe at the end, this uh, data warehouse bus matrix so that you can see a little bit how on the very high level, when you present to someone uh, on top, how specific parts will be integrated and you can also see the conform dimension. So you put the dimensions here uh, as columns and you put the areas as rows and then those that are included. So underwriting I will have on these dimensions, policy premium billing I will have on these, commissions I will have on these, but claims transactions I have on all those so that you can see. And this becomes, of course, much more complex at the end. But it's a good, let's say, something that you can see almost on one page, how your dimensions are connected to your uh, specific process and uh, specific, let's say, effect uh, table. So this is something that it's usually very nice, let's say, output of all those exercises in uh, modeling. So this was, uh, my view, a little bit an overview on this uh, data. So I think we have maybe just one or two minutes for questions. And then uh, the next colleague will continue if I understood correctly, Asna. Yeah. So thank you, Grega, for this uh, interesting lecture. So since we are now being overwhelmed with data, I guess this is really of extreme importance to know how to organize your data well enough so that you're efficient in looking at them. Uh, does anybody have a question? If, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand or you can type your question in chat. So maybe, uh, can you tell, uh, tell us uh, which insurance companies you worked with in the past? Uh, yeah, we work a lot with our local, let's say our original insurance companies. So we work a lot with Triglau. We work with Sava on some projects. We work now also on Gen with Generali on some projects. Uh, then we work with some insurance companies in Middle East. And we are working now also with some German insurance like HDI and uh, some Baltic insurance companies. And as you said, there is quite a similar problem. So the most, uh, let's say, needed people are spending a lot of time on data gathering and they are using the because they need to do their process because they are obliged to do it. They need to calculate it. Mm -hmm. And then they spend a lot of time on that part. So we are mostly, let's say, involved in building, let's say, a more modern data pools and these data warehouses, and also then helping in specific, I don't know, IFRS calculations that were needed now, or the whole flow, how it should look like, how this should be integrated. And 
So, and I think also Easter will discuss a little bit about the predictive analytics that it's maybe also interesting mm -hmm. how maybe some general linear models are now being calculated and what are the possibilities and, and so on. So, but I would say the majority is still in this area because they know if they could free the time of all the actuarial departments, not mm -hmm. focusing so much on data, they could be much more effective and much more happy because probably they don't like to do this. So. Uh, I guess it's uh, really a non-trivial problem to organize all these things in in the right way. Yeah, and it's uh, also politics, you know, so the data <laughs> is okay. But when we are discussing uh, definitions, like give me an active uh, customer or something like that, it gets complicated. And then of course, mm -hmm. different departments, who will be the data owner? It's also a people problem. So but it, the entity unifies if it's transparent uh, so i think mm -hmm. so i guess that in in one way it also helps to clear these uh, business processes within within the insurance once you have to really think about those things so there is no space to be chaotic anymore if you would like to have this well organized in your data warehouse yes. Yeah, and that maybe, you know, we don't come to the management board with different figures from actuarial department, from sales, from risk, and et cetera. So this is also. Yeah, this might be embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, it usually it's the uh, situation. Mm. Super. Okay, so uh, thank you, Grega, for uh, this interesting lecture. So. Yeah, thank you for uh, having us. Yeah, I, I hope we will stay and listen to also to other interesting lectures that would follow after that. So thanks yeah. once again. Yeah, thank you. Bye.